Okay, very short introduction because this next session really is the tech for good ecosystem in full effect. Um, so to talk us through this, I'm going to hand over to Kirsty McIntosh, um, our head of partnerships for the Scottish Tech Army. Warm welcome. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, as uh, Graeme just said there, this is, this is a story that actually started here last year on the 25th of April in this very room. And, and it shows you what can happen when people pull together and it really matters, the outcome really, really matters. So it's a story of uh, an app called Soundscape, which is used by the visual impaired community. It was created by Microsoft and ran as a research project for about seven years. Um, on the stage with me at the moment are our guests, um, Jamie and Tommy from Guide Dogs, and in the middle, Stuart Beveridge, who's the head of assistive technology for Seascape, which is a five based charity of which I am the chair of the board of trustees. So just telling you that because you need to know. So um, Jamie and Tommy, I wondered if you could give us some background, please, to what Soundscape actually is, um, what it does and how it's used and, and how important it is to the people who do use it. OK. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so Soundscape is, is a, a 3D audio um, app which actually supports people to have better independence when they're traveling around. So it, how it works is when somebody's walking past the points of interest, they'll, they'll hear through this um, 3D soundscape where that, uh, what that point of interest is and it'll, it, where, it, um, where it sounds like it's coming from is the position where it's coming from in relation to their position. Sorry, I've just butchered explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> it made sense when I was thinking about it. So yeah, ba basically, <laughs> so let's, let's put it into context. So somebody's walking down, let's say, High Street and they, they, walk, they walk past the shop that shop on the right hand side, they'll hear the announcement of that point of interest on the right hand side. It'll also tell them the street, streets that they're on. And then there's, there's some significant kind of tools that are built into it and baked into the app as well that can be utilized when people are having orientation and mobility training. So you can put specific markers or geocaching um, in, in certain points. So it could be that there's no physical landmarks in a certain area and there's nothing really that anybody could rely on using the cane or other senses, and you can actually use Soundscape to put in some, a, a marker to, to mark that point. Um, it's, 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 I think a, a, a really nice way of explaining it is probably explaining a, a, a user that I worked with during the pandemic, and unfortunately, they'd, they'd actually bumped into somebody because they, they couldn't um, judge the distance, and they'd had a really bad experience a bad reaction from the person because they hadn't social distanced and this had really not their confidence going out independently um, and they really wanted to go into their town center this was in the the north of england in the northwest and they they, they weren't a, a soundscape user they hadn't they hadn't come across it and I, I introduced it to them and we started just just playing around with it and it it was kind of a tool to kind of Get, help them to step out and just give them that extra bit of confidence when they were going out. And the way we used it was that it gave them the, the kind of orientation when they were in the um, high street in their, in their town centre to, to get them orientated and gave them that extra confidence. And they wanted to learn to get to a coffee shop to meet one of the family members so they could go on and have that coffee. Um, and we used Soundscape and used the markers to get them pretty much to, to the door. It was, a, it was actually a cafe Nero that they wanted to go to, but it couldn't get them that, that, that final distance. So we matched it up with using um, the, the LiDAR and the door, door detection within the magnifier app on, on iOS. And that combination of technology, it didn't just enable them to step out and, 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 and get, get to that destination. It enabled them to get back out into the community get back out meeting people and give them back that confidence that had been taken away from that experience. So I hope that kind of answers it in a little bit. I don't know, Jeremy, have you got anything yeah. else you wanted to add? Well, I'm, um, I've used Soundscape myself uh, as a visually impaired person. And yeah, absolutely, it gives you the confidence in the, the sort of the three-dimensional audio map that it sets up. It gives you the confidence in knowing where you are. Um, especially if you sort of, sort of know the route, but then, you know, the route could change when the light changes and you can get maybe the confusion of, of oh, I'm not quite sure where I am. So knowing the with the street announcements and everything like that, having that 
literally it is the confidence to know where you are and then to be able to know exactly where you're going in a familiar route. And I think uh, in my profession as a, as a VRS, a visual rehabilitation specialist, delivering mobility training, it is that again when you're, you know, like, so traditionally it would be setting someone up with a long cane and doing the route and then repeating the route and doing it and doing it until they get it. And it really speeds up the process sometimes when you can then maybe about two or three sessions in, introduce soundscape, introduce some markers on some of the, like maybe the, the road crossings or the corners that could be difficult with. And then the fifth, the sixth time after that, suddenly the route's getting picked up. Um, and I've, I mean, I've got about three or four different anecdotes I could say about using soundscape and uh, training people too. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, Stuart from, uh, from Seascape, um, you were involved, along with Guide Dogs, in fact, in the development of this originally with Microsoft. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how you engage with organisations like Microsoft and then also your experience of Soundscape and, uh, and what happened when you found out what was going to happen to it in December 2022? Yes. Am I? Oh, yeah, That's I'm it. on. Um, <clears throat> so in 2000, and I think it was 18, I was approached by guide dogs to let me know there's this revolutionary, uh, revolutionary navigation app coming that Microsoft are currently beta testing. It's a research project. Do you fancy being one of our testers? And in my role, I thought, yeah, I've never really did this before. So person Grant from Guide Dogs, who you'll meet shortly, he came out and got me up and running with the app. And I started beta testing it for Microsoft, eh, which was very confidential at the time. And I gave them feedback through their, their online forums and Guide Dogs. And then after maybe six, seven months, it was actually released to on the App Store to the, the actual public, so anyone who had an iOS device could download it free of charge. And it actually gave me the bug because it was the first thing I had ever really beta tested, and I thought, you know, I should be doing this more and more for other companies. So I still currently, I can't say too much, but I, I work with Microsoft going forward on a, a personal point of view with different devices and apps. Uh, I work, I beta test products for specialist companies as well. And it was all thanks to that initial, um, you know, beta testing of the Microsoft Soundscape app. And then I actually used it in conjunction with my guide dog on a daily basis because the one thing that Soundscape can't do is avoid obstacles. So I still need a mobility such as a cane or a guide dog that he will take me you know, around obstacles, around people, etc. But Soundscape, through bone conduction headphones, it basically shows you the way in terms of a 3D audio map. And as I say, I use this every day for around four years. And then all of a sudden, through one of my uh, many news channels that I subscribe to, this bulletin came up. Microsoft are discontinuing Soundscape as of I think at the time it was something like the 30th of June, 2023, 20, 20, yep. And my first reaction was, oh no, because as someone who uses this as a totally blind person every day, what are we going to do? And I just couldn't believe that this was happening. And um, I thought, well, there's nothing really I can do. I can't reach out to, to Microsoft anymore. And all of a sudden, a gentleman in America, again through one of my many newswires, put this petition out. And I read his, his, his review on why have, I, why have I put this petition out? And I thought, you know, I can completely relate to this. And I then thought, OK, I'm not expecting Microsoft to do anything, but I'm going to put the petition to as many charities and organizations as I can think of and get them to share it and see how many signatures it'll actually get. And one of the charities obviously was my own, Seascape. And Seascape actually, well, whatever Twitter's calling themselves nowadays, but they, <laughs> they, they, they tweeted um, the post. And it was actually Kirsty, who is our chair, was at a conference at the time. And again, Kirsty, correct me if I'm wrong, but she saw this post come up on her feed 
through Seascape. That's and right. after the conference, the next day, she emailed me and said, Stuart, could you just give me a call and explain a wee bit more about what Soundscape actually is That's and great. why it's so important? And from then, it actually just snowballed. And I'll let somebody else take up the story, but that was my initial involvement. Thank you very much, Stuart. Yes, uh, that conference happened to be this conference um, on the 25th of April last year, and I happened to be sitting beside Charles Eels, who is the head of social impact for Microsoft in the UK. Um, and this, this uh, tweet um, appears saying, stop Microsoft from, from doing this thing. And, okay, I kind of stepped quietly away from Charles, and went, I'll be with you in a minute. <laughs> um, and, and I had a look at it that evening, and, and I actually, I realised that, um, I don't know why my slides are going back and forth, um, I realised that Microsoft had made the uh, source code available as open source. Um, and I thought, oh, that's really interesting, I wonder if there's something that we can uh, do about that. So, uh, at that point, um, I, I mentioned it to Alistair, and I said, we should go and have a look. We should totally go and have a look at this at some point. Um, I'm not quite sure when it's being switched off, but we should go and have a look at it. The app had actually been withdrawn from the App Store in December 2022, and the service itself for existing users was going to be shut down on the 30th of June 2023. So somebody who was in the audience that day is a man called Dan Ridge, who works for PwC, and I would like to welcome his colleague, Rob Leishman, onto the stage from PwC, because at this point, PwC joins the story. Thank you, Rob. Grab your microphone. Thank you very much. So, Dan sent us a really lovely email um, the following day, and we go again and back again, and he said, I hope you are well, and thanks again. Um, and he said, it was a great day and it's given me a fresh perspective of what is possible when we all lean in. And the continuation of that, that message was, in six weeks' time, we have our annual volunteering day, one firm, one day. Last year, we were digging tree roots out of a, a park somewhere in London and, um, and I would like my engineering team to be using their skills for good. Is there something that we can do? And, and I went, yeah, you can please go and have a look at the Soundscape repo and see if there's something that we can do here to reproduce this app before Microsoft turn theirs off. Can you take your day, can you take your team of volunteers and give us uh, a sense of whether what we want to achieve here is actually possible? Can we redo this? What's missing from the code base that Microsoft had to withhold? Um, is there something that we can do? How much would it cost to get this thing stood up and, and running? And, and what would it take? Um, and, uh, and they went, yeah. Okay, and in fact, um, I don't think I told you this, Rob, but uh, that Dan said, I'm not giving them the brief for the project until the night before, otherwise they'll spend every night before we actually get to one firm one day trying to make it work in advance. Um, so Rob, you are part of that cloud engineering team, you and your, your guys. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your experience of that, please. Yeah, so that was great, and to be fair, we did have a little look beforehand. Dan didn't manage to keep it secret that much. Um, but no, so like I say, like Kirsten says, we came to the, the kind of summit last year, um, really blown away with, with what we've seen and, you know, as I said in one of the sessions earlier, my experience of volunteering was, you know, going and digging tree roots and painting the kind of office buildings or primary schools or whatever it may be. Um, so, yeah, to know this type of volunteering was out there was brilliant. Um, and, you know, once we got the brief to look at Soundscape, um, it sounded like a really, really interesting project. It was um, when we got on to the one from one day, you know, experience, we had people from guide dogs and people from like actual users of the application were on the call with us to talk through you know what it meant to them what it going away would mean for them how it impacted their daily lives and all that sort of stuff and you know it really had um, a massive impact on everyone that was there to know that what we were going to do over the next you know six to eight hours um, could really impact people's lives going forward um, you can see us there in our that was our office in London and um, you can see myself and we had for about five or six engineers um, in our Edinburgh office, and then we had some of the um, product teams down in London um, speaking to folks about the app. So we sort of ran it on two work streams. Um, myself and a few of the guys in Edinburgh ran the sort of more technical aspects, you know, trying to get the iOS app working, get the back end up and running. Um, and the guys down in London did more of the product based um, part of the, the project. So they talked to users of the app, found out, you know, what did they use it for. Um, what do they do on a daily basis with it? Is there anything else they would like to see in it? Trying to build out a roadmap for the next, you know, six months or however long the, the app may live for. Um, and yeah, that was that was our kind of experience of the day. Um, I think at the end of that day, we got 
so close to having it all up and running. Um, it was really, really painful not to get it up and running. So I think it was in it, like two days later, I think I emailed you to say, I've eventually got it running because I just couldn't let it lie. It, it just had to be finished. <laughs> um, and I think the other aspect that came out of that day was we looked at how Microsoft had built it. And as you can imagine, a Microsoft research project, were they really that fussed about how much it was costing? Um, you know, there was some infrastructure thrown at it. We had Kubernetes clusters. It, you know, there was a lot of infrastructure in deploying that. And yes, you know, it, it was fully functional and it, it did a great job. But to replicate that for, you know, the Scottish Tech Army and, you know, the charity going forward, it would have been quite costly. So we sort of looked at it and thought, you know what, there's probably a different way to do that. We can use some serverless technologies. We can, you know, deploy it in a different way, which will make it run a lot more cost effectively. Um, and I think we ended up doing a second day yesterday on, you know, bringing that to life. How could we, you know, take what was there, container-based applications and run them in a serverless manner? Um, and I think I'm right in saying that's how it's deployed today. It certainly is. Um, it certainly is. So yeah, that was that was kind of my experience. Of it. Absolutely, and and Tommy and Stuart, you were both involved in that in that one firm one day. You were you were guiding the product team as they as they looked at the potential roadmap for uh, for what might come next. You know, what's missing? What would be you know what would be more awesome than it already is? You know, all that kind of stuff. Thing. It was it was. Did you enjoy the day? It was uh, it was good fun. Yeah, I definitely did. I think to have that opportunity with Blue Sky, thinking that might actually end up with something tangible at the end. It was yeah, I can remember kind of the. The feelings that I had, I was yeah, very excited. <laughs> Probably came across on the call when we when I joined it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I think I'd just like to use this opportunity really to to thank the the Scottish Tech Army, the Tech for Good Alliance, everybody at PwC for for all their efforts. I think it it really highlights the kind of how special this type of collaboration is. It it, it really shows the, the the power of of collaboration, innovation, and and kind of, yeah, it, it's just a really beautiful thing. So, yeah, thank you, thank you much, everyone. Tommy. That's very kind of you, Tommy, thank you. Stuart, do you want to add anything to that, or are you? Um, if that's okay, yes. Um, <clears throat> I also thought it was a great day, and, and it, see, it was amazing to see how many people wanted so much, you know, more from the app as well. And But I just thought, right, let's just get it up, keep it going, and just make it the soundscape that we all know and love and that we're used to which is exactly what the Scottish Tech Army did. And I, I want to kind of echo Tom, what Tommy was saying, because I, if, I don't know if Kirsty remembers this, but when we, the app was first made sort of live and public for download, there was a serious bug. And this was on a Friday. And I looked at it on the Friday. And you, you should be able to search for a specific address and then just have Soundscape guide you there, uh, literally through sound in the direction that the address is. And I put the search in for my mum and dad, and I thought, right, it's only, you know, 100 yards away, this will work, no problem. And I could not get past the search, so it would not recognise any addresses, you know, anything like that. And I emailed Kirsty straight away, as I, as I do, and so, Kirsty, you've got a serious bug here. And Kirsty, do you remember, Kirsty, you oh were God, looking yes, at it? I remember. And, and <laughs> so she emails me back and, Stuart, we're watching live feeds our end. There's nothing wrong with it. And I'm, right, what have I done wrong? And I end up having to screenshot and actually do an audio demonstration. And at about maybe half past six at night, ah, I think I see the point now. And you know, about maybe within eight o'clock, at eight o'clock the next morning, there was an update and it was fixed. So that is how efficient and dedicated the PWC were to actually fix that. I expected, I didn't even, I just checked it on a whim on the Saturday morning. I thought, ah, oh, they'll, they'll take the weekend and it'll be available, you know, <laughs> starting next week. It was available the next morning. So I get huge credit to to what the, the PWC have done, and I think that just shows their, their utter dedication to this project. Thank you very much, Stuart, thank you. So, um, the story goes, we had three months to do this. Microsoft, we found out, had delayed the uh, shutdown of the app from the 30th of June to the 31st of August. PWC's work had given us the confidence to say, actually, we think we can pull this off. We think we can reproduce this app. Almost, We wanted it to be exactly the same. It was very important to us that the users had exactly the same experience. This wasn't about 
launching improvements and making the app better than it had been when it had been Microsoft's version. It was, this is the one you know, this is the one you're comfortable with, let's see if we can reproduce that. But we only had three months to do it, we had to the end of August. And how are we going to be able to do that? We'd had two fantastic days from PwC by that point, and they remained involved, but, but actually that was they'd given us so much in just those two. So when you're th thinking about the fact that you might only have one day's volunteering, it's amazing what you can do when you have one day. So I'd like to invite one of our wonderful independent volunteers up onto the stage, John Gregg, please, to tell us a little bit about the experience that he had, because what we had to do was build a team to make all of that possible um, in, for three months. Um, and, and John, who actually does in fact work for Microsoft, but was with us in an independent capacity, was, uh, was part of that team. Welcome to the stage, John. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that and, um, and Stuart's <laughs> message there about it's no working at <laughs> six o'clock at night. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so uh, th thanks very much, Kirsty. Uh, so yeah, my name's John Gregg, I'm a technology advisor at Microsoft. Um, and worked with the STA on and off, supporting different sorts of events and stuff like that uh, over the over the past number of years. And the um, Take for Good Summit uh, last year, um, I was inspired to join as a as an individual volunteer. I just felt like a, you know I wanted to join, get new experience, do some do something different. <laughs> I bet you didn't know what you'd yeah. signed up for and, at um, that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a call not not too long after signing up, maybe a week or so. Um, you know, Kirsty. Kirsty wants to speak to me, and I'm like, right, okay, a bit of interest in Kirsty and Alistair. Um, and uh, I'm like, we've got a project uh, we think you might be interested in. And uh, the, you know, we went through the story of Soundscape. I actually, had, I actually hadn't heard of the, I actually hadn't heard of Soundscape myself um, as a Microsoft research project. So this is the first time I was getting acquainted with it. Um, came up with a story, or heard the story about how it was having such a big impact in so many people's lives. They asked me if I would be willing to you know, volunteer to help lead the team to, or lead a team, <laughs> as it transfers, and lead a team to sort of bring it back. And the, the sunset date, you know, like Kirsty was saying, was, you know, was the uh, end of August. Um, and so that was probably a bit more than I initially bargained for when I, when I, when I signed up uh, looking to try on uh, different projects. But obviously, like, just understanding the impact it was having on people's lives, we heard the stories. I just said, you know, how could I, how could I possibly say no to that? Um, so um, I think. The, the only thing was that, you know, Kirsty and Alice probably weren't aware of my infamous organisational skills, but I mean, we'll, put, we'll, put that to, we'll put that to one side. Um, so to, you were great. <laughs> just to recap the challenges as I saw them. Um, so, you know, you know, coming at it, obviously, from a technology advisor sort of, you know, day job sort of hat. So there was under three months to deliver an identical service to thousands of people globally that needed it. Um, the, yeah, and... That was the hard sunset. There wasn't. There was not going to be any further extensions in that. Um, the team hadn't been fully assembled yet. It was a core team, but at least you know with partners sort of identified who'd already done some pieces of work. Um, the application itself, when you sort of broke it down, it was, although it was not long, it wasn't millions of lines of code or anything like that between the cloud services and the iOS app and stuff like that. It was still complex and had tons of different technologies in it. Um, it was all initially based on Azure, obviously been a, been a Microsoft product, and I think with the SDA team, um, all, you know, most of the experience was in, in and around um, was in and around uh, AWS, and I know that Alistair was looking to sort of you know branch that out, sort of diversify a bit. Um, we knew that there was incomplete source code, so obviously when you're you know doing a migration project on on something you normally have at least got all the code and you, you know you do the migration and everything's great but we could identify that there were, there were things missing and it turned out that there was some IP that Microsoft didn't want to release as, as part of it um, so you know what are the gaps how do we test for those because um, you know, undoubtedly there's you know many different ways you know how many different ways people use an application it's almost impossible to test for all of those things um, understanding the cost and the funding um, you know Rob's already mentioned some of that but part, part of the you know, part, part of this, like, my advice was to, like, okay, let's try and replicate this exactly like for like so that we don't change too many things so that at least if, some, if something breaks, we can go and ask, you know, I can go backwards into Microsoft and ask some of the people who worked on the project, like, for any help on fixes and stuff like that. Um, there were loads of groups out there trying to rebuild and reboot it themselves, um, but also un re undertaking, like, re-engineering, or, or basically re-engineering uh, big parts of it, which... Is helpful and isn't helpful at the same time because um, you know 
that that's 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 not what we're trying to achieve. We're just trying to achieve get. We need to get this up and running before it before it you know sunsets. Um, but I think the um, I think the um, main, one of the you know main one of the main things obviously with PwC doing doing their first volunteering day on it basically meant we had most of the pieces of the puzzle there. Um, so my main involvement was mostly up front. It was figuring out those costs. I mean, I do quite a lot in my, that in my day job anyway. We've got to figure out a budget. Um, the, you know, got to, I'm one of those people that needs to understand something almost end to end if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm involved in it. And I'm quite lucky that through my job, I get access to a whole bunch of cloud credits and all that sort of stuff. So that let me spend, you know, all my evenings and weekends for, you know, a couple of weeks sort of, you know, piecing it all back together, all, all the Microsoft code that was, that was, that was released. Inside, man. <laughs> um, and, and my, you know, I even borrowed a friend's MacBook to sort of, you know, do the iOS uh, that bit, which was like, you know, to which got all the instructions out the back of the PwC hackathon, and you know, managed managed to get it, you know, at least the, all the Microsoft release stuff up and running. So at least we knew, okay, right, there's there's something there's something here, um, yeah, there's something here that we can that we can take forward, and and I think that's when the second PwC. Uh, a hack day. It meant well. We, we, you guys had got it working independently as well. Um, uh, you guys had got it working independently as well. Um, but it meant that we can actually then focus on right. Okay, how do we optimize this and how do we lower the cost as much as possible? Because you know we've got to work. You know, we've got to work up to that over time. Yeah, as you know, as the users uh, sort of increased and all, all that type of good stuff. Um, and th there was a sort of core technical team that we quite luckily like some. There was like open source mapping technologies involved. Um, I think we struggled with iOS and we ended up going far and wide. The team was as far as Kazakhstan, I think, at, at one point, if I, if I recall Absolutely. correctly. In the image up here, you can see um, the chap in the middle, Tony, Tony Trizzle, who is, um, uh, is actually uh, from, I think it's Nigeria, uh, but he was working for a bank in Kazakhstan. <laughs> um, but he volunteered specifically to be part of this project. And in the top right, Duncan Kent actually was an iOS engineer that X-Design lent to us for a week and a half to help us get it over the line in time. Um, Adam Ward in the bottom left, Adam is uh, one of these people that has reskilled and he has wholeheartedly thrown himself at this, uh. at this challenge. He is still working on it. He's currently a one-man Android developer, um, sort of working out whether this is something that we can reproduce for Android, which would make a huge difference to, to people who don't use iOS. Um, and, and really, Chris was our tester. Chris was the guy that was walking about. He kept sending us uh, uh, audio of, of how it was working and the sounds it was making and the fact that it was calling out a university in Bristol while he was walking through Glasgow um, and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so every single one of those people, Jamie Ferguson was pushing, was, was pushing the, uh, the stuff into the, the Play Store or the App Store. Sorry, I'm an Android person. Um, to, into, the, into the App Store and things like that. So drawing all of these skills together is actually really what could, took it to back. And, and, and John's work, you know, your work particularly around helping us to understand the Microsoft environment um, and what those costs and how we could optimize them. Um, because as a result of what they were doing, I at the same time was going out and going, how the hell are we going to pay for this? You know, we, you know, we're, a, you know, in terms of funding, we're a small organization. We can't pay for this stuff on our own. We, it has to be free at the point of use. This is not something that we want people paying for when they download. Um, so I started working to try and find some, uh, some funding that would pay for uh, the hosting costs, which we were driving down as low as we possibly could, thanks to the work that the team had done, um, but also operational management costs, because you know, phoning somebody up at 3 o'clock in the morning to say it's not working, it isn't really conducive with volunteering. They pretend not to take it well. So it's about actually, you know, sort of contributing to all of that. Um, and um, Ashfaq Azim is in the audience today. Ashfaq is from the Thomas Pocklington Trust, which is a big funder in the visually impaired community. And they very kindly gave us the funding for our first year uh, to, to get this app up and running and, and fully, uh, you know, fully operational from a financial perspective, but also to give me time to go and develop a funding framework for this, which we're going to come on to in a little bit around how we actually keep this sustainable um, in the long term. So, John, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So we launched after all of their hard work. We literally, with hours to go, we turned ours on about 9 o'clock on the morning of the 31st of August. Microsoft turned theirs off nine hours later, PST. Um, but we were able to go. I spent, I was like, I was like, I felt like a rock and roll star. I was on podcasts. I was on doing telework. I was on, you know, getting in touch with the press. My 15 minutes of fame. Um, I literally saying Soundscape is back and, um, and telling the story effectively a little bit like this about, about why this was. And it was amazing. The, the visually impaired community, I'm sure like many um, communities of interest within the disability sector, 
the tic tac is amazing you know the way that they communicate with each other the way they let people what's going on and you could actually see it rolling out across you know lots and lots of different communications channels that we couldn't um we couldn't just keep microsoft switched on theirs was going off but the ours could be turned on and it would be almost identical but we had to do um, a bit of brand work it's mine i'm sorry to all of the designers out there um but we had to do some design work and sort of put new things in there and i have to say that um Microsoft all the way through were hugely supportive of what we were trying to do. They had made the code open source. There's probably north of, I have no idea, $10 million worth of investment they gave away for nothing after seven years of, of research. It's an incredibly generous thing for them to do. And it would have been great if the app could have carried on running, but the commercial realities are that that's not going to happen. But it's such a vital uh, tool that's continued to be used today. It's, it's, Stuart, you said something very interesting the other day um, at one of our board meetings, in fact, where he was demonstrating an absolutely amazing haptic belt that he has, uh, which uh, like guides him by pushing against his body to let him know if he's moved off target and things like that. It's two and a half thousand pounds. It's an amazingly clever piece of technology, but it's two and a half thousand pounds. Soundscape is free. So this is a tool that people can use when all they've got is their, is their mobile phone or their iOS. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a really important piece of technology, I genuinely think it has a future and it should have a future. Um, so again, thank you all uh, very much indeed for, for your contribution. So a sustainable future for this kind of thing requires um, an ecosystem approach. Microsoft had the power to switch this service off because Microsoft owned it. It was theirs to decide what to do with as they see fit. It happens a lot in the disability sector and Tommy, you might be able to, uh, to in fact, all of, any one of you actually might be able to contribute on this. This happens a lot in the disability sector. Really clever technology appears. It's fantastic. It's transformational people. It can't wash its face uh, commercially, and it's taken away again. By which point, people have become confident with it, and now they've got to go and build that confidence again on another app and another piece of technology and another piece of technology. Some of this technology should stay in the sector. It shouldn't be lost if possible. Making it open source is a way of doing that. Creating some kind of sustainable funding mechanism in order to keep it there hosted and up to date and continuously improved is another thing. So I've been working for the last, uh, since really August, I think, when TPT uh, generously gave us their funding to, uh, to make sure that we can sort of try and develop something, something like that. Um, I am, it's been one of those exercises where I feel like I've been touting it around like a, a hairbrush salesman uh, to lots of sort of different organizations sort of trying to get this point for, across. Um, but actually, Philippa Crowther here is in the audience today from the Wilberforce Trust in York, who are a, a large uh, vision impairment charity down there. And the Wilberforce Trust is joining that funding framework as one of the first members, um, which we're hoping will start the momentum going with, with many other organizations as well. And we are talking to Site Scotland, for example, has expressed um, interest and said that we could mention their names today. So Site Scotland, thank you very much. Um, and we are talking to the national charities across the UK to get their involvement as well. Because this is a global product. This is available in downloads all over the world. And we are at, Alistair, is it 8,600? 8,600 downloads since we went live on the 31st of August last year, right across the world. I mean, not absolutely every single country, a lot in the UK and a lot in the US. But nevertheless, it's a global product. If we can pull in people who are willing to make a small contribution into that funding framework around the world, then it costs everybody beans. Nobody's shouldering the burden of that cost. Everybody gets to use it for free, and nobody has the power to remove it unless the community itself doesn't actually want it. Uh, so that's where we are now, and, um, and we will... Um, sorry, that's our next one. My apologies, I thought I had another slide. Um, so my focus for the next 12 months is going to be on developing that funding framework. The focus for our volunteers and our Tech for Good Alliance member organisations is to continue the uh, improvements to the app to add in the features that the users are telling us that they would like to see. And yes, start investigating the possibilities of Android uh, because there's a huge section of the, of, the, of the community that doesn't use iOS, it wants to use Android. And if we can develop a version of it for them, um, then we, we will, but it's a huge task. Effectively, we're starting again from scratch. So if I could ask everybody please to put their hands together to say congratulations and thank you to everybody. <laughs> for it.